As weird as it gets. <laughs> well, I'm pretty jump around, blah, 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 you know, and just erase all that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Longsworth. I play drums for Origin. Um, I'm in a World War II bunker. It's really cool. Uh, I just woke up, just set up a drum kit, and eventually I'll pick up a pair of drumsticks. I'll work out a little bit, like push-ups, and just try and wake up and play some drums. This is the fucking aftermath. The philosophical approach to playing drums. Mm. That's, that's tough for me. I don't really know because you have the guys that approach with a very structured, very grid-oriented sense, and they become amazing, fantastic, organized drummers. And then you have these other guys, they're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of a blur. They, they, they almost don't know what they're doing, but they're masters at that. So it's as formless in thinking as I can get. So it's the one, it's like one of the, there's like only a couple of things I do in life that, that renders me gone up here in, in the head. It renders, you know, you're, you're, you're free in the cosmos. And philosophically, I don't know, it's just, it's flow. It's, it's, it's nothing, it's nothing and it's everything. And that's about as, I guess, as weird as it can get as far as explaining how I approach the drums. I sit down behind the drums, and it's dream time, right? I can play a song that I learned that I learned to play 10, 15 years ago and I might have just developed an easier way to hold the stick during this time. I might have developed a better way to sit. Am I sitting closer legged? Am I sitting wider legged? Am I sitting up straight? You know, And those are the kind of things that will make all the difference in the world for a musician is just being able to refine, even if it doesn't from the outside show a huge, uh, there's not a huge difference that people on the outside can, can see. I am still 20 years on after that perfect feeling blast beat technique for me. You know, it, it is still important to work on 260 BPM, simple 260 BPM bomb blasts, single foot blasts at whatever, two foot blasts. It's, it's like, it's, it's sticking with the fundamentals while carrying on into other techniques and other forms of music. Never forget the fundamentals. with listening and knowing how to listen. You know, listening, listening passively and listening actively. It's interesting because it, it's, very, it's very similar to what you might, to what an, an athlete might say. It's just as you get used to it, as you become more acclimated to it, you know, the water's not as cold after you've been in there for a few minutes. So you, yeah, you work on these techniques until you're blue in the face and you, and you, you start, uh, this sounds kind of corny, but you start seeing between the seconds. You can run between the raindrops and all that silliness, right? You're working on a technique to play faster and more accurately. So how do you play fast? Speed's a byproduct of control. So you work on this technique for a long time at a moderate tempo to a click, slow tempo even, to a click, and you try and carry this technique on for you know, three to five to 10 minutes. You know, you, you wanna count minutes, not bars. You wanna count hours, not minutes. So just the more time you spend mastering a technique and controlling it, and yeah, next thing you know, you're, you're at these um, 
these insane modern death metal tempos and it just never quite seems fast enough. That's because you can see between the seconds. You can see like a boxer knows what to look for. He can see so much just in the time that a dude's gonna drop his guard and throw a punch. He can see a million things more than, because than, 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 that's, a, that's, a, that's a nanosecond. So you just, you're able to see, your eyes get quicker, your ears get quicker. I had seen the double, the, the, it was, it was a heel toe technique and I originally saw it with a friend of mine named Jim Kincan and he bought a double VHS um, thing called Ballistic Double Bass by Joe Stronsick. We watched that and we thought, wow, that's really cool. And we didn't really, we didn't apply it at that point. I think we fiddled around with it a little bit, kind of kept on because at that point it was very much about this, the Florida technique, as I call it, you know, the single foot, single foot blast beats you know, straight, you know, double bass, you know, all this. And it, it's, there, was, there, was a, there was a construct that you wanted to utilize and apply to all death metal. The idea of, util of using different techniques for different things at that time hadn't really occurred to us because we were still young at it. Times went on and a couple of other dudes were coming out doing this really weird double bass. And I was like, that's, that sounds really fast and it sounds a little different. And that's kind of cool. And I got to asking these guys about it. And actually, you know, again, it just kind of went on. And one day I was sitting at home and I just was playing around with these pedals and do it, do it. And I did that and I was interested at in how that worked. And yeah, I was just like, huh, gunk, gunk. And I was like, hmm. So automatically I needed to explore that. And the idea behind it was, is Paul Ryan, you know, the guitar player of origin, our, our songwriter, our, our fearless leader. He uh, was getting so fast. He was, like, he was developing this picking hand that I was kind of, you know, and so I'm like, well, how am I going to keep up with that? Because at that time I was going like this. I was leaning the stool back and I was planting on my heels and I was playing heels down. And it worked to a specific tempo. And then my knees were hurting and my hips were hurting and all that. So I found that double stroke thingy and it, it worked. And I, it took me about three months to get it in shape to record an album. And that became Antithesis. That's the story of my double stroke technique. As far as monitors and being able to hear, I, I like to hear kick and snare. And then I just kind of hear what I hear from up front. The important thing is your ears aren't your only, your only tools on the stage. You, you gotta watch things. I mean, there's body language. Have your guitar player turn around when you're at practice and watch what his elbow does. What his picking hand does if he's over there. If he's over there, you're gonna be able to see his fret hand. Watch his head. Where is he at in the song? Okay, you know. So it's just about being able to communicate with your musicians on stage. And I think that trumps everything else. I don't think you need to hear I don't need guitar, I don't need bass, I don't need the sampler. I just, if all my guys up front are having a great time and everybody's smiling, that's all I need. It's my job to set the stage for my band members. And it's my job to provide, you know, drums as close to machine as possible. Some might consider that no feeling, whatever, but like death metal kids want to hear machine guns, not drums really. It's my job to make sure that these three up here it's gonna be easy for them. Just when I have the energy, when the set's easy, and it's fun, and all the dudes up front are happy, and that the crowd is happy. Um, and that's what counts for me. And that's how I get enjoyment out of it. For a tour means having a finish line. Staying away from you know, bad foods and alcohol and exercising and getting, you know, as much sleep as possible. I start my vitamins like a week. Oh, I mean, I, I always take vitamins, but I try and up my vitamins even more. It's about having vitamins in your system 
first, not after to keep you from getting sick. But, but as far as playing is concerned, like we're all in different parts of the country. You know, Paul's in San Francisco, Mike is in New, uh, Kansas, Jason and I are in New York. So it's, again, it's really about being, being, you know, formless so you can take whatever comes at you because you can't prepare for a certain thing and then go out on tour because every time you go out on tour, there's going to be, it's going to, something different's going to come at you that you weren't ready for. You could never prepare completely for going on tour. At least I can. The most important thing about that album, about the Gorguts record, and about the musicians involved in that is that I, I'm not going to completely speak for, for Luke, Kevin, and Colin, but there was a constant vibe with those guys the entire time where it, it was really about putting yourself in a different place from what you normally did. And for me, that was 100%. Between you know Luke LeMay and myself, it's let's take this guy that's capable of something else and and push whatever that something else may be. Because there's something else going on with every musician. You know, the dude's got, you know, he's known for this, he's known for that. But if you look, you're going to see something else in most musicians that you can, you know, z you know zero in on and, and go for. And that's what Luke did with me. He's like, wow, I think you could probably do this and let's get in a rehearsal room and see if I'm right. And whatever it is he saw, he was into, so we went with that. And with Gorguts, those guys were putting me in such weird, weird time signatures to play in. Okay, um, yeah, can you do that in seven? And I'm like, I don't quite understand that. And so Colin would literally write out on a piece of paper, you know, how to count this and where to put the snare drum goes here, and then the kick drum's gonna go here, and I would just like sit there and read this and try and understand it. And then we would just go over these weird little exercises to, to, and it just pulled my brain in this direction and in that direction. And because I'm a physical player and I'm able to, you know, do what I can, you know, athletically as a drummer, allowed me to, you know, apply and think. But that album was extremely difficult to write. It was difficult to play on. And to me, that was like, that was, that's the epitome of art is you kind of punish yourself to get something really awesome and unexpected out of it. And because when those songs were done or listening back to them, I was like, well, I, I can hear the tech, I can hear the beat that I worked on, you know, and the point of view I had at that time, but I can hear how much different it sounds now that it's done. And then you go back and you try and play it and you couldn't play it because all of a sudden you have a different point of view. And there was, many times with those songs where I had to relearn how to play because I would just come into a better or different understanding of a specific part in the song. So that album was like three masters and a drummer. Something I got really interested in, and uh, one of the coolest double bass things I ever heard was, you know, Hot for Teacher. That'd be the Thomas Lang version, because he, right? And it, I just played the Alex Van Halen double bass shovel and started dropping the heels. this turns into my bass drum groove so it's almost a pat -a -fla -fla. 
but why would I use a pataflafla on death metal? It's cheating, right? Yeah, really? Why would I use a six-stroke roll on death metal? Isn't that cheating? It's like a two-foot blast. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Is it, you know, triggering, cheating, two-footing, cheating, one-handed roll? Is that, you know, cheating? Double strokes, be it hands or feet. People like to beat you up on the internet when you do this kind of music because you're kind of, it's kind of a extreme death metal. It's kind of a masculine thing. You know, it's, you're, you're making a statement just by playing this music and people like to come at you for it for certain things. And he can't really play because he's triggering. He can't, you know, but um, whether it's two footing or whether it's one handed rolls or double strokes on your feet, you know, if you're going to sit there and just put a technique down, then you're just kind of putting your own musicianship down, your own credibility as an artist, as a musician. It's dumb. Don't tell a dude that a two-foot blast is less than a single-foot blast because, I mean, I love playing two-foot blasts at certain tempos. I love playing single-foot blasts at certain tempos. Single-foot blast feels great at lower tempos. Tempos, it's awesome. Same thing with any other kind of technique, right? But uh, it's music, it's an art form. There's no rules. So the minute you start putting rules on things, and the minute you even like take over a conversation, just say, well, I prefer. I mean, unless the dude asked you that question, shut up. Don't, don't make the conversation about you. I mean, unless the guy goes, what do you prefer and why? That's when you talk about that stuff because you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. You're going to be a dick when you didn't mean to. And believe me, I know about being a dick when you don't mean to. I, I get, I've gotten plenty of that in the past. But you're, you are supposed to commend this guy for using what he thinks is the better technique, what technique works for him. That's what makes him interesting, is by watching this guy and seeing what he does. If you don't like what he does, if you think what he does is undermining all the hard work you've put into it for years, and he was able to get to that technique quicker, because he used a different technique, shut up. Just don't talk, just be quiet. You don't bring the, the room down because you don't like what this guy does. And it, 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 looks like, it looks like posturing to me. If you're a musician up on the high, you know, you're in a place to teach, it's almost like racism in music. <laughs> and that's getting heavy. But uh, I'm attracted to musicians that are attracted to what makes this guy different, you know, be it a technique or an approach or a sound, you know, because that's why we all do this, because we can all do it a little bit differently. Thanks for watching. I'm John Longstreth. Uh, be nice to each other on the internet. It's a hard spot. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Bye, have a wonderful time. Fantastic. We are the legend. We'll see you real fucking soon. Thank you. Good night.